Hello, everyone. I'm happy now to present uh, the third of our lecture series in, in new bonds. Uh, and thank you very much for this university to invite me to be the International Frank Key Professor uh, for 2021 and 22. We will talk about the growth and, uh, and weakness of newborn farm animals and infants, like we did in the previous talks. This talk, we will focus especially on the newborn farm animals and what uh, they have learned us about newborn survival. Uh, first, I'll just briefly introduce our group in Copenhagen. Uh, and this is a group of, of many uh, different uh, backgrounds. Uh, and we work all on newborns uh, from infants to animals. Um, we are called comparative pediatrics at the University of Copenhagen, and we work with the, all these different issues uh, from tissue investigation on immunohistochemistry and histopathology, where we also work with researchers a lot here in Antwerpen, behavioral studies, where we also work with researchers here in Antwerpen, um, cognition studies, body imaging, obstetrics, uh, feeding studies, and infant studies also, and pediatric surgery. Now, how does that all come together? Well, to understand uh, the weakness and the uh, health of newborns, we need to work across pieces. I'll come back to that in a minute. What we do is translate a lot of our knowledge from pigs to infants, and we also try to learn from infants to how we can actually rescue some more of our newborn farm animals. And especially in this talk, I'll try to, to, to um, focus on the lower part of this arrow translating also from infants to animals, using infants as a model, you can say, for animals. Comparative pediatrics, what we do is that we have these different life stages of mainly pick as our experimental model, and we have corresponding life stages for infants, and we try and translate between them, because in this life period, we have the greatest morbidity and mortality uh, across these uh, uh, species, both infants and animals. Um, what we study is hormones, metabolism, infection, nutrition, gut microbiota, brain and lung and immunity, at least on the pig side. And correspondingly on the infant side, we have uh, a number of uh, study topics that I won't uh, uh, come into in detail in this talk. But we try to also translate uh, from infants to piglets and get information from what we know from infants to help uh, newborn farm animal survival. And of course, we also want to translate the other way. Now, is it really possible to translate from infants to animals? Uh, that depends on many factors, and I'll return to that in a minute. First, we'll have to realize that birth is the most difficult life transition of, manimal, of animals altogether. There's so many things that are changing when we turn from the fetus in utero to the newborn stage where uh, the animals may die during the delivery process here represented by pigs and the mortality during the birth process, the so-called stillborn piglets is 10% at least in Denmark and it's 15% within the, the first three or four days after birth. So that's an enormous amount of individuals that are dying. In Denmark, this amounts to 7 million individual pigs per year. So many pigs are born too small and apparently too early for them to survive. We'll come back to this big question a little later. First, we'll talk about the physiological transitions at birth. What is it that is happening at the time of birth? Well, comparing the fetus situation, we have a sterile environment, immune suppressed environment, where nutrition, oxygen, and excretion occurs via the placenta rather than independently. And we have a stable temperature in utero. When we go through the birth transition with our animals, we come into a, a, a state of microbial environment, which is immune challenged, where and where nutrition, oxygen, excretion occurs via the gut, the lungs and the kidneys of the newborn. And in addition, we have a very variable temperature. So lots of changes are taking place. So maybe no wonder that this is a difficult physiological transition. When we take a look at the, um, mort the survival uh, around this time in life of mammals, of, of different mammalian species, then in 1990, I had this survey. So this is actually an old slide from, from 30 years ago that I had. 
and where I've indicated the, the mortalities in this period. And as you see here, there is seven, there are 87% average mortality in piglets. Now I mentioned before that actually now it has risen to about 25%. So it's going the wrong direction. So what can we do about it? In men or in infants, survival is about 99%, so a lot higher. So is that just because we are better at taking care of infants? Let's get back to that question a little later. So these uh, infants that are born uh, very fragile, especially the preterm infants, defined as less than 90% gestational age, less than 37 weeks gestation, um, they have a surprisingly good uh, uh, survival. So when it comes to lung maturation, so I show you here a paper uh, from about 10 years ago, um, where this author called it a survival miracle of very low birth weight infants, because it's almost unbelievable that they can survive altogether. So the biggest surprise is that most of these infants survive and thrive until very early in gestation when they're born. It's almost, uh, yeah, it's almost indicated as a miracle and miracles of course are very difficult to study scientifically. So it is difficult to study these small miracle babies. They have problems in their brain, they have problems in their lungs, they can't breathe, problems in their gut to be, that uh, inhibits their digestion and they have problems with their immunity to help them combat bacteria. So how is it possible that these very small infants can survive? Um, amazingly, these, all these organs get activated just after birth, even after a very preterm birth, and, and, and help them survive, so that actually only a, a minor proportion of these infants suffer from severe complications. Now let me show you the mortality of these very underweight infants and immature infants. Now if we take a look at two types of infants here that are born very immature, then it's those that are born with a normal birth weight, and there's those that are born very growth restricted or so-called SDA or RUGR, small for gestational age. So not surprisingly, the mortality rate is even higher for those that are born very small and early, uh, but at about 90, uh, 29 weeks gestation, which is about 40%, or 60% uh, gestational age, according relative to term, mortality is actually quite low. When it comes to uh, those with a normal birth weight for their uh, stage in gestation that are born early, mortality rate drops even further. So that, for example, a baby that is born in 26 weeks gestation has a mortality rate which is about 15%, which is quite low. Now, 60% gestation here, the mortality rate is less than 10% for both groups. When it comes to 90% gestation, that's what we define as preterm. So most of those babies, they survive. So how is it that we can make these babies survive when so many of our farm animals, they die? Now let's take a look at some differences between uh, animals and, and, and infants when it comes to organ development. First, I'll just show you gut development. So in the human, we have a gut development that starts relatively early uh, in fetal life and continues until rather late postnatally. So it's very gradual. And we have a weaning, a, a weaning cluster of maturational changes where development occurs particularly rapid and also a birth cluster of maturational changes that occurs there. If we compare that developmental trend of the gut in human infants with that in rats, another common experimental animal, um, we have a gestational age of 22 days gestation, but in the rat development is late and rapid, meaning that most of the gut functions and structures, they don't really develop very well until after birth. So no wonder that the rat nutrition is very sensitive to gut disturbance and that many of the studies about gut development is done around the time of weaning. So there is a weaning cluster of maturational changes that is very distinct in the rat and a minimal birth cluster of maturational changes. Now let's put the typical farm animals in between here and I'll just take the example from the pig. So the pig has 
115 days gestation, and it has a birth and weaning cluster of maturational changes, but it's intermediate between humans and the small rodent experimental animals. When it then comes to the, to the time at which these different species can be born prematurely and still survive, then that depends on the organ and the species. So this was gut development. Lung development determines mainly when these, when these different species can be born. So lung development is very close to normal term in rats, also close to term in pigs, but a little earlier in humans. And that may be one of the reasons why you can actually give birth to a 50% a, a gestational age human infant and that infant would still start breathing. Uh, when it comes to the brain development, it's late developing in humans, it's early developing in pigs and intermediate in uh, the small rodent species. Finally, when we talk about immune system and the ability to combat bacteria, it's early developing in human infants, it's very late developing in pigs, and it's intermediate in the small rodent species. So as you can see, it all de depends on the species in question and that we cannot say that each organ they develop in parallel in the different species because they don't. So when can we deliver these different species preterm, immature, ahead of the normal time of birth? In humans, well, we can say maybe 60% gestation, 29 weeks gestation, as we indicated before, is the time when we can deliver these infants with minimal mortality and they can start breathing normally. In pigs, it's a little bit closer to term. So about 10% prior to term, we can deliver pigs and still expect that they survive and breathe independently. While in small rodent species, it's hardly possible to deliver them ahead of the normal time of delivery because they simply cannot breathe. So that is one of the reasons why we have much earlier uh, and better survival in infants relative to pigs. And even normal pigs, newborn pigs, are quite immature in many aspects. And we'll return to that a little later and also discuss what we can possibly do about it. So all these organs that are developing from before birth, over birth to after birth is not only the gut, but of course also immune system, brain, lung, liver, kidney and muscle and bone. So many organs develop and, and, and they all uh, have to be in order for the uh, newborn animal to survive. When it comes to mice and, and rats relative to pigs and to humans, yes, all these organ systems develop differently. And that is the main message of this. And we have to relate to this when we study developmental trajectories of the different uh, species. So newborn research, there is a need to look across organs and species always. When we are discussing perinatal research, per perinatal research we need to look across many species and organs as I indicated in the previous slide. In my own research, I, I previously worked with cows and calves and also newborn sheep, which is a very commonly used experimental animal model for studying fetuses and newborns. We've also worked with this species, which I think you may not recognize, but it's actually newborn mink. And as part of the COVID restriction here, we. Uh, sacrificed all the Danish mink in the country. So now we don't work with these anymore. And we work with infants certainly, and then a lot with pigs. So for the remainder part of my talk, I'll mainly focus on the pigs as an example of the farm animals. But these farm animals do develop, develop very differently. And it's very helpful to be able to look across the species when we talk perinatal research. So Selection for high litter size in Denmark has occurred over about 30 years. We've selected for getting very many piglets per sow, per mother. And I'll show you here what happened over the last 30 years in Denmark. So we increased our gestational length, the length of, 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 of pregnancy with two or actually three days by now. 119 days is the average gestational age. And it's impressive that we can move something as conservative biologically as gestational age with two or three days. The du duration of farrowing, unfortunately, also has increased from two to three hours to eight hours, which of course give 
rise to some of all the problems that we'll discuss a little later. Total born piglets has risen from 11 to about 20 now or 21 at the moment. Still born piglets, of, um, unfortunately, also has risen, not only in absolute numbers, but actually also in a percentage wise or more than doubled. Mortality until weaning has also doubled. And, um, and then some of these uh, factors have not changed that much. So what has that produced with regards to production results delivered by our main breeding company, Dunbred? So the wean pigs per sow per year has increased over these last five years to about 40 at the moment, 40 piglets per mother per year, which is of course a tremendously good production results. But what we will try and focus on is the mortality that comes with it. So it's not all good because the total piglet mortality over the same five years, five to seven years have also increased quite dramatically. Selecting for high litter size in pigs is not a new thing. We've done that also for, for many of the other types of pigs. And here's an example from uh, America, from the US, uh, where over 12 selections, they were selecting for live born piglets. So total born piglets was increased at that time from 10 to 12. So this is about half of the litter size that we have these days. And I show you these old results to show that the principles of what's related to this genetic selection for big litters and fast growth is the same 30 years ago as they are today. So what we find is that the live born piglets uh, have not did not increase much in this study over the 12, uh, 10 to 12 generations, but the stillborn piglets doubled. So with selection for high litter size, the number of stillborn piglets increased. And when it came to the number of wean piglets, we'd, wean piglets in that study back then, we didn't really achieve much. Of course, we would want the number of wean pigs to increase also. That was part of the whole purpose but that didn't happen due to more stillborn piglets in this case and higher mortality. That higher mortality was partly related in those studies to a decreasing birth weight from about 1.3 kilogram uh, before starting of selection for high litter size to about one kilogram, which increased of course the mortality of these small piglets. So more wean pigs, uh, was not really uh, the case after these 12 uh, rounds of selection, but we had smaller and weaker pigs. Now we have changed that in Denmark over the last 20 years and uh, have gone, the, the birth weight is back to 1.3 kilogram. We have more than 15 wean pigs per sow and at the moment more than 21 uh, piglets of the total bond. So what we select for um, in Denmark, the, uh, besides, uh, besides the high litter size, is of course also selection for growth or lean tissue growth, such that we can have good burgers on, uh, for the food. And um, will that have uh, any effect on newborn saliva? And I'll show you here some results that indicate that by selecting for fast tissue growth, especially uh, meat production, we may actually also select for poor survival. So here I show you uh, over some generations of selection uh, uh, for lower back fat thickness. So when we selected, this is the, uh, the green line here and the fat decreased from 18 millimeters to 10 millimeters. So it's very effective to select for lean tissue growth in piglet production and we know that. But what happened also was that survival rate actually uh, decreased correspondingly in this particular study from, from, from Canada there back in the 90s. So there's indications that when we select for fast growth and, and, and uh, less fat, that we'll also select indirectly for a, a poor survival, which of course is problematic. Now, when we have a high genetic potential for survival versus a low one, if we have the low uh, genetic potential for survival, of course, there is the greatest survival for the biggest piglets. And when piglets get below about one kilogram, then survival decreases dramatically. 
the question we can now ask is whether it's a whether we are able to select for better survival and that has actually been shown possible already uh, back there 20 years ago if you select for high genetic potential for survival you can move this curve to the left such that you can increase survival uh, with 20 to 40 percent uh, after selecting for it in these piglets. And we've done the same thing in Denmark, but still, as I mentioned to you before, we have about 15% of all our live newborn piglets that die within the first uh, five days or so. So those um, dying newborn piglets, can we describe them in any way to help us indicate what is the problem? I show you here some organ weights related to survival of newborn pigs from a big um, uh, Dutch study uh, back 20 years also. And, and they showed that the liver weight of these uh, surviving newborn pigs were positively correlated with their survival capacity. So liver appears to be an important organ for survival of these animals. Likewise, they also showed that adrenal gland weight especially was very closely cor correlated with survival capacity and also the weight of the small intestine. So what we can learn from these large scale uh, studies on estimated breeding value for pig survival is that the liver and the adrenal and the small intestine are very important organ for survival. We could maybe imagine why the liver would be uh, important for metabolism of nutrients, the gut for digestion of nutrients. What about the adrenal gland? The adrenal gland is the key hormone controlling organ maturation around the time of birth uh, across most mammalian species. So therefore, actually, it's not so surprising that the adre adrenal gland were very positively correlated with survival capacity of these piglets. On the other hand, if you have a very high adrenal glands, you may also have more cortisol. Cortisol is a catabolic hormone. So here is an indication that to select for survival may actually go against uh, selecting for fast growth. So there's a controversy here. Now let's take a look at these small piglets again and, and see who is coming out dead after delivery and who is dying within the first days. So as we mentioned before, those piglets that have a, a birth weight below one kilogram, they have um, a, a percentage of survival that is lower. So this is the percent live uh, pigs with increasing birth weight. So as soon as we go be beyond one kilogram, we have a decreasing survival rate of those that are born life. What about those that are born dead? So are they, are they also the small ones? Well, to some degree, yes. Um, the smaller ones uh, are also many among those that come out dead after the delivery. But it's worth noting that there is 10% also of the more normal birth weight pigs that also die during the delivery process. So there's probably many things other than just the birth weight that determines that you die during delivery. And I'll come back to this interesting question a little later. First, we'll take a look at the duration of farrowing. So uh, how does the duration of farrowing relate to the total litter size? And what you see here is that if the duration of farrowing is very long, like five, six, seven hours, then the litter size is very high. So seven to nine hours of delivery time when litter size is very high. So no wonder there is more and more problems with stillborn piglets. So stillbirth, birth order and blood pH lactate levels to confirm that actually there is a problem with those piglets that come out last. Here I just show you some older results with lower litter size. So if the birth order, so when the birth order gets after 10, then the stillbirth rate goes up. So the stillborn piglets are those that come out last generally. And also similarly, uh, the stillborn piglets and those that come out last, they have a decreasing pH level and an increasing lactate levels in their blood. So this is typically the markers we used for for, for piglets being asphyxi asphyxiated 
uh, uh, stressed during delivery um, is when they have a low pH and a high lactate level. So uh, when uh, we have recently done many studies on, on, on pH levels in newborn cord blood, and they can go to as low as 7.2 uh, in, the, in the latest um, deliveries from the litter. Now, now let's take a look at, <coughs> at one of these um, deliveries. And here's an old fashioned picture. And of course, farrowing in, in, in practical pig production never occurs like that, that you have a nice little lady there wiping the skin of the newborn piglet, but this is the ideal situation. And I like you to also see that the cord is intact here for a long time after delivery. That is the ideal situation. And that is a lot of, you can say love and tender care for the delivery. And as also researchers are working with here in Antwerp, and this love and tender care is many small factors that are actually quite simple, but that can improve uh, neonatal survival tremendously. And also note that this intact navel cord for a long time actually is part of uh, uh, the contribution to big survival capacity. Now, how does perinatal complications lead to mor morbidities? Um, I'll, I'll like to present these perinatal com uh, complications into three different categories. Those that occur before birth, fetal placental complications, which are typically reduced blood flow, nutrient flow, oxygen, stress and inflammation in utero. There may also be problems during the delivery process, of course, itself, the expulsion of the fetus, and there may be problems just after birth, uh, giving rise to morbidity and mortality. So what we will now describe in this figure, uh, a simplistic figure, is trying to understand what, how does these different factors contribute to neonatal mortality. First of all, there is this thing about fetal oxygen levels go down, correspondingly the fetal CO2 levels go up. Which effects would that have? It has the effect on the brain and, and nerves and uh, affecting the, the, the nervous system of, of the newborn. Um, in, in physiological terms, this uh, decrease in fetal O2 levels and increase in CO2 levels leads to a respiratory acidosis where pH is decreasing and lactase is increasing, leading to bradycardia and hypertension, so heart problems. And the uh, bradycardia and hypertension will consequently lead to organ tissue hypoperfusion with blood and oxygen and also contribute to the hypothermia that we often see as a sign of poor adaptation just after birth in a newborn. So this is the way that a fetal compromise here with a lowered fetal O2 levels and higher CO2 levels will lead to hypothermia and organ hypoperfusion just after birth. What also will contribute to this respiratory acidosis is if the cord ruptures too early. So we saw in the film before that the cord was intact for a long time, but if it rubs too early and there's too big litters, we get often cord rupture too early. We may also have a compression, physical compression and asphyxia uh, of the cord as such, so that it's obstructed already before the fetus is ex ex exposed, which also then contributes to the respiratory acidosis that occurs during the delivery process. Recently, we've tried to make studies on this that I'll show you a little later. Uh, there may also be the simple fact of misplacement of the fetus, crowding with too many fetuses, and, and a generalized physiological stress that will also influence the heart rate and create uh, a low blood pressure or hypertension. Finally, there is the uh, possibility that just after birth, uh, the newborn is born in a very uh, a shitty environment, a dirty environment that will create infections. And there may also be various inflammatory responses, oxidative stress and cold stress that may further contribute to this uh, organ tissue hypoperfusion, hypothermia. Now let's take a look at the CS and brain and nervous effects. Here. What, what will they lead to? they actually also lead to neonatal hypoxia because they affect the respiratory center in the brain. 
and, and this will indirectly then lead to metabolic lactoacidosis that interacts with the respiratory acidosis as before. So we have a combined respiratory and metabolic lactoacidosis. Interestingly, these stress conditions here, they will lead the, the, the fetus to, to get rid of its meconium. And we can often see that if newborns are born with a yellow surf surface of meconium, it means that they've been basically shitting into the amniotic fluid. And uh, if they aspire this meconium, this may create a pro-inflammatory lung damage, which is very uh, uh, common. And that of course, again, will lead to further neonatal hypoxia. This metabolic acidosis together with the bradycardia and hypertension will lead to a multi-organ failure, including both the gut, the lung, the heart, the kidney, the liver, and the brain. So many organs involved. And together, all these multi-organ failures will then lead to perinatal death or severe morbidity. So this is just a way to try and describe how can it be that so many pigs are dying in the first two, three, or four days after birth. I think it's a combined effect of these things, plus a few other things that I'll mention a little later. Now let's first take a look at the, at the postnatal survival indicators where we are comparing survivor, surviving piglets with those dying during the neonatal period. So we have the surviving piglets here and those dying here. So what we see is that the birth weight of those that are dying just after birth is certainly lower. It's not a lot lower. This is a relatively normal birth weight. Um, but 24 hours later, then the survival, no, the, the birth weight, the, the weight of those dying pitless is a lot lower. So something indicates that they fail to take up colostrum and grow, whereas those that survive, they, they, they manage to take up colostrum and grow or simply have the capacity to grow. When it comes to the birth temperature, Yes, there's indications that those dying piglets there initially has a lower temperature, as you can see here, uh, and then also a little later. A, li a little later, they generally have a lower body temperature, but if they're not growing and haven't taken up colostrum, of course, that will contribute to their hypothermia and uh, metabolic deficiency. Interestingly, also, the, the vitality score is, is much lower. And we have these various vitality scores that we have for both infants and piglets that can help us predict which uh, piglets will be uh, later survivors and those that will die anyway. And this is actually quite important for the farmer to decide when he wants to euthanize some of the piglets because there's simply too many of them. Uh, some farmers use this uh, uh, infrared camera to try and find out which piglets have a good metabolism. And this is just a picture of, of uh, using this infrared camera to show the metabolism of the piglet. So what is wrong with these piglets that die? Is it their brain function? Is it their lungs? Is it their, is it their gut or is it their immunity or uh, uh, something else? All these factors could potentially be involved in these uh, problems. And when it comes to learning from infants, we have in the past mainly been interested in the brain functions that are affected by the delivery complications. This is something that we know very little about from farm animals, but that we are now starting to, to study. So let me show you here the variation in maturity and weight at birth and what happened over generations of selection um, in, in many countries. So uh, uh, 30 years ago, we maybe had these uh, 10 piglets in utero that had to decide when is the optimal time of being, being born. And, and it's of course important to know the exact timing of, of, of being born because being born too early and being born too late is both a problem. So when we have optimal birth in a much bigger litter size, 15 to 30, we, uh, in our experimental unit, we, we commonly have, have litter size between 25 and more than 30. The last litter was 32 in our unit a few weeks ago. The variation in optimal birth time will likely be greater, uh, meaning that many more pigs will be born seemingly immature, even if they are all 
born on the same day, some will be more immature than others at that time. And this means that we can maybe learn something from the immature infants to help us uh, uh, guide our practice for immature pigs. Now let me show you here what will happen when these, when these piglets go through the birth canal and there is a low piglet vitality. So my suggestion to the many or, uh, things that are potentially involved is the prolonged uterine contractions that will create asphyxia and oxygen deficiency. There is a hypoxic insult then during delivery where blood acidity will uh, go up, CO2 will uh, go up and lactate will go up. This will indirectly, as I showed on the sketch before, lead to low core and skin temperature, brain nor ne neurological damage is something we haven't really investigated yet, but we recently found very clear indication in our studies that uh, some of the delivery complications in piglets can lead directly to brain damage, and which may explain part of the, the great um, mortality. Uh, it may also lead to a meconium stained surface, um, as we mentioned before, and in utero growth restriction, immature respiratory drive because the CNS cen center of respiratory drive is affected by the hypoxia. We, it may lead to a compromised gut function, immature defective behavior, and the time to reach the otter and start to suckle will be increased because because of weakness and because maybe also of brain damage. And consequently, we, we may end up with a low uh, passive and innate immunity uptake from mother's milk. So all of these are factors contributing to the low piglet mortality. So what's the problems on the, on the mother's side with the poor pharaoh competence, at least for 30 or so piglets? Well, they are not adequate uh, with regards to uterine contractions. There might also be psychological and physiological stress on the sow side. Uh, there may be poor gut health in, in, in the pregnant sow and constipation. That's a common problem uh, with modern type sows that get very refined foods. Um, there may also be a dysmetabolism in the sow and it may suffer from semi-starvation uh, because of very infrequent feedings. And potentially there may also be some infections and inflammation that is a problem on the mother side. So this is just the mother side and the, uh, the, the newborn offspring side of problems when it comes to these large uh, litter size pigments. So delivery related developmental impairments, if we again study this delivery process, and know that there can be dystocia, asphyxia, ischemia, and hypoxia during the delivery process. What are then the physiological functions in the body that can be affected in these pigs when they are dysmetabolic, show slow growth, show dysbehavior, and more infections? What are all the organs involved? We have studied this relatively little. Uh, in research until now, and we think it's it's very important to look to to infants to gain some of all the knowledge that already is known from the weakest infants that we have studied over 30 years. So one of the things that is affected by by these complications is metabol overall metabolism of all the body cells, which of course will influence the thermoregulation and cell growth. So that is the mechanism whereby these birth complications may affect. Um, uh, and create a dysmetabolism. Uh, likewise, the lungs will be affected by the hypoxia itself and then further decrease the oxygen supply and thereby affect cell function. The gut will be affected and uh, consequently nutrients and immunity and microbiota will also be affected and we are studying that intensively at the moment. So are there any indications that birth hypoxia will affect the liver? Well, there is indeed in the very clear indication that uh, hepatocytes, the liver cells are affected, and that will uh, affect many factors in the body, including nutrient supply and immunity. We know also that the pancreas is affected and its hormones and its enzyme secretion. So, so this is another aspect that has uh, until now been relatively little studied, but it, that is known from infants 
that this is affected after complicated births. Cardiovascular-wise, uh, we know the heart is very sensitive to hypoxic conditions in utero and during delivery. And that will, of course, also affect blood supply and oxygen. Kidneys are very sensitive to diminished blood supply and oxygen supply. And that will affect ex ex excretion capacity. And, and finally, the brain is a very important organ that is very sensitive to birth hypoxia. Also, many, many studies in humans that investigate this, and that will affect the cognition, behavior, and the motion. And we believe that some of the problems we have with many piglets being squashed by their mother uh, lying on them is actually due to uh, uh, partly a brain problem in the newborn pigs in response to birth asphyxia. Finally, there is also the possibility that both the bone and the muscle are affected by these birth complications. It's not something that has been studied much, but there is a uh, possibility that the slow growth of these uh, of these affected newborn piglets is actually due to their birth uh, complications. So these are a lot of studies that are ongoing and that still needs to be studied a lot. So when we have a compromised birth, we have multi-organ effects, as I indicated in the previous slides. And we are trying to study that uh, uh, in, in these type studies at the moment that I'll just give you an example of. We compare pigs that are born by normal cesarean section with those that have had their cord clamped for seven to nine minutes in utero before they're born. So we, we basically sort of mimicking or, or reflecting a, an obstructed cord during a, a delivery. And then in the, in the most recent studies, we've then uh, intervened uh, uh, also with, with a diet containing plasma proteins or not plasma protein to try and see if these plasma proteins could help um, alleviate some of the problems created by the birth asphyxia. And that creates a, a typical two by two uh, study. And for three or four days where we take various blood samples and keep them in incubators, and then we study all the various organs that are indicated there. And these are studies that are ongoing at the moment. The questions we ask in these studies is which organs are most sensitive to the hypoxic insult. That is important to know because then we can also better uh, organize how to alleviate the problems. So the question is also for us whether any of these damages can be repaired by plasma immunity uh, elevation. Another possibility to alleviate some of the problems in response to asphyxiated births is to provide oxygen therapy. It's not something that is used in practice, but when we turn to infants, that's the first thing you do if you have an asphyxiated newborn infant, is you provide oxygen in the right amount. Not too much, not too little, but oxygen support. So uh, can we use that for piglets? There's a few studies in the past that have tried that with actually quite amazing results. So I think there's still something to be studied there. So what these researchers have done is basically put an oxygen mask over uh, the snout of the pig and providing them with extra oxygen if they were in need. The problem is that this is also dangerous. You can very easily over oxygenate a newborn and create more problems than you create help. Now let me show the results of some of these researches. Uh, first, the New Zealand, uh, the study from New Zealand, you have some asphyxiated pigs giving oxygen within one minute of birth. And, and those asphyxiated piglets, they had a, a O2 saturation level of 85 or 87. So normal saturation levels is 100% in, in the blood. And when, when these have received uh, oxygen, this is the right column over here. So then they increase to 88, no, 98% uh, oxygen saturation, which is maintained throughout 24 hours. What is interesting here is that after 24 hours, there's an increased glucose levels in the blood. There's an estimated increased colostrum intake, which is quite a bit higher than in the controls. And then even the weaning weight of the piglets has increased remarkably. So oxygen, provided an increased growth of the piglets until, we get, until weaning for these 
asphyxiated newborns, of which there is maybe 10% in each litter. So quite a remarkable effect. When it comes to those that are growth restricted, specifically the small piglets, should we just give all small piglets oxygen? So all small piglets do not necessarily have a very compromised oxygenation. And by giving them oxygen, we elevated it a little bit. And then the question, can we equally find an effect on blood glucose levels, cholesterol intake and weaning weight uh, later? And remarkably, there is a, a very strong effect. So I think there is something there that we need to address. There was no uh, significant difference in the pre-weaning mortality between the RUGR piglets that had received oxygen versus not, but still the variation was high. And as you see here, the mean value is uh, 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 about halved in those that were oxygen treated. And this is supported by a much earlier study uh, by Herpin et al in, in 2000, where they saw that the mortality was also uh, halved by giving oxygen to those that were low birth weight, whereas those that had a normal birth weight, there was no difference. So these are mortality rates for different categories of, of birth weights. So what else can we do uh, just after births? Well, I already indicated that it's important that these piglets, they get to their, to their mother as fast as, as possible because a fasted hungry intestine can be a very sensitive um, intestine. Here is some studies that we did many years ago where we fed the newborn intestine with colostrum over the first day or we fasted it over the first day and gave it instead parental nutrition, uh, intravenous nutrition, but not giving it any milk orally. And this is how fast it goes with the, uh, with the villa surface and, and how fast it's, it's damaged. So also for that reason, it's very important that we feed our newborn animals as fast as possible. And here in the final slides of my talk now, I'll just give you some uh, uh, film clips of, uh, that will show you also how we do our various studies in, in Denmark using uh, uh, immature pigs and growth restricted pigs both as models for pigs themselves in production, but also as models for, for, uh, for infants. So we typically have studies where we take them about one week uh, where they have uh, cesarean, typically they are div delivered by cesarean and uh, get assisted re respiration in the first 12 hours. They are provided with passive immunity, parental nutrition, thermal support and aseptic conditions. The, the big risk factors in this neonatal period is hypoxia, hypovolemia, hypothermia, immobility, metabolic dysregulation, necrotizing enterocolitis, impaired immunity, sepsis, and very high permeability of the gut and, and, and brain. So uh, uh, th these are some of the studies that all may be alleviated or supported by giving the various treatments that we are studying. When we go a little bit further into the postnatal phase, these small weak animals can uh, start to suckle, and 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 we but we need to have very high attention to their microbial protection and their locomotion training because they have difficulty walking, and their risk factors continue with dysphagia, maldigestion, slow growth, bacteremia, necrotizing enterocolitis further motor dysfunction, imbalance and impaired innate immunity and pure neurodevelopment. So these are all characteristics that we see uh, in these piglets also after about nine days. In our three week studies, we then start to test their cognition and behavior. Um, they can start to drink independently and turmeric independently, and they still need feeding support and microbial protection, uh, but they can start to explore and learn and behave normally. Um, the risk factors that they have until three weeks is a delayed body growth, dysregulated metabolism, moderate maldigestion still and a delayed adaptive immunity and neurodevelopmental delay. All of these organs are involved in these processes and adaptations, but they adapt at different paces. And what I'll show you here is especially the brain that in the pig is the 
If I give you a picture of the power of the section, then after delivery of these little piglets, we uh, take them out, put them into these incubators, and supply them with parental nutrition, and there's a camera above this incubator to be able to follow them for hours. There's always personality in each week. You end with a port. You see here the port milking. That's a good Port practice. And here is finally a little later. We start to experiment. Very conditioned. Where we test it. This particular is this one. Test a system where they remember by yeah, uh, never regrets here and, and the number of correct choices is indicative. Yeah. So court sampling. Uh, we do a lot and we try and work a lot with the court during delivery because we believe that a lot of the problems related to newborn problems is actually a court problem. We do uh, court milking, as you saw in the film before, which is important. And equally, it's important in the farming industry to make sure that they don't lose too much blood during delivery. Here, you also see a piglet that has on its surface some meconium stained uh, um, uh, a surface, which is a problem when it's, it's aspired, it's, it's very aggressive to the lungs. Sometimes you'll see a, a knot on the cord, also indicating that also in normal conditions, the cord will sometimes have an obstruction that will affect uh, the newborn blood, uh, blood supply. Um, we do it sometimes artificially, make a complete cord obstruction to mimic how the gourd can be obstructed during delivery. And we have a, a, a whole series of very exciting studies at the moment where we can imitate all the complications of difficult birth with these complete uh, cord obstructions. Vice versa, we can also uh, uh, work with the so-called uh, uh, principle of delayed cord clamping. So we saw in the film a little while ago that this cord was naturally intact for quite a long time after expulsion of the pig after a vaginal delivery. And that is actually very helpful for the transition of the newborn into the uh, normal life. So uh, also in when it's uh, coming to giving birth to infants, we do that in common practice, leave the court for a long time uh, and, and let the placenta loosen its, its court when it wants rather than do it forcefully. Uh, too early. So early cord clamping is not an advantage neither for animals nor newborn infants. At, a down, at about uh, day five to seven, we birth these piglets yeah. because they don't have any sucking reflexes when they're born a little immature. We have to use quite a big effort to mm. uh, teach them to start uh, to talk out uh, independently. And the same is true for many of the pigs that are born hypertrophic and small birth weight, they have poor sucking reflexes. So it's not only that they don't get to the other, get yeah, them it's the already also mechanics. basically don't have their parents sucking in order. And when it comes also to their behavior, we report 
their behavior here and their various movements in, in an open field system such that we can analyze the way they work around the various system and how their brain is functioning. And uh, more recently, we have worked with a group here. Development in these piglets, and thereby we can have a system for improving uh, uh, the motor development with various interventions. Slightly longer term, we And then also vice versa, use some of the studies we have in piglets for improving neonatal care for infants. Let me show you here how we do the, the, the base system tests. One more picture of the base system. And you see here the pig is confused and can't really find its way, so this is a stupid pig. Uh, but it takes some time to find the reward. Dictative of a picture that is taking a long time to exit. This is how we do our studies, and it takes a lot of you on these studies. Uh, imagine try them to use the piglets by putting them in different directions, but that they could still be able to navigate uh, by color cues in a uh, close room. And here you see also an example of um, a stupid pig and a clever pig. So the clever pig is, is able to find the clue very easily, whereas the stupid pig takes a long time to find out and remember, try and remember. And it knows that if it doesn't, if it goes in the wrong direction, it'll get punished and don't get its reward. So that's how we test it. So uh, I have now come to an end uh, and hope that I have given you a little bit of inspiration for how we can care for these uh, weak newborns. Uh, and the question we can ask about neonatal care for both infants and farm animals is whether we are improving or just wheel spinning and not really getting anywhere. And I'll try to illustrate this basic question with two pictures here. I think it's very important that we uh, continuously focus on some very practical and clinical aspects if we want to save more newborns. Basic science is important, but sometimes I, I guess we maybe overdo it. So we may apply uh, omics research to these, yoma, uh, to these newborns to try and find out what's going on, or we can just use classical A to B science, so to speak, and, and this is actually quite different ways of attacking the same problem. So the question I ask is whether we are getting somewhere by answer, by, by getting these simple answers to simple questions, or we are trying to get very complex answers to fuzzy questions. So I'm a little bit skeptical to all this omics research also in this the newborn area, because it doesn't yet bring us very far in the understanding of how the newborn survive. We can do it as a supplement, but it's important that we also keep to the simple practical and clinical science questions. We should not forget the hypothesis driven approach where we declare what we want to find out. Uh, even if we can use the explorative and idea generating research also as a supplement. We should remember our simple tools fitted for the purpose that can also be used in the farming industry 
because the complex machinery and unpredictable results that often these very basic science questions will give us will not really be able to solve uh, many practical questions. What characterizes this more practical and clinical science approach is its simple numbers, it's precise and we can repeat it, whereas the big data statistics and bioinformatics involved in the more omics approach to newborn survival is, is making things sometimes more complicated than it has to be. So the practical and clinical science relates to practice in real life, whereas this relates to theory, thought, and systems. And that's all good, but they have to be go hand in hand. Finally, uh, sometimes why we go for omics research also in neonatology and newborn care is because it seems to be beautiful, impressive, and colorful, like this lady here, uh, uh, and relative to this old gentleman here, black and white, which is more boring. But I think we have to remember that we have to combine the practical and clinical questions with the basic science questions and, and combine the two and not forget that some of the questions that we are asking are actually quite simple when it comes to newborn uh, care and a little love and tender care will actually help a lot of, a lot of problems. So I think we'll end here with a slightly more philosophical approach to what type of research we are in need of uh, in this area. And then I look forward to your, your questions. And in the following talks, we will go more into uh, specific feeding procedures and also specific effects of the gut microbiota um, in this newborn period. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention.